Good morning again. Welcome those who are watching online, um, wherever you are. Always, Monica from uh, PA. Is that uh, correct, O'Shane? Monica from PA is watching with us this morning. Uh, Vavo in Brazil and all the people across the globe. Millions, millions of them all tuning in today. <laughs> uh, Joshua chapter 12. Uh, we've been going through the book of Joshua. This is uh, 11 weeks, 12 weeks. I lose track, but we're going to talk about this thing to its entirety. Uh, get your pillows out. I want to start reading Joshua chapter 12. Um, these are the kings that they um, defeated. Um, king of Jericho, the king of Ai, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jamath, the king of Lachish. Do you really want me to read that all the way through? And all the way to Joshua chapter 24. Uh, from here to Joshua chapter 24 is the allotment of the land, the God's blessing, and this peace period, okay? Have you ever wondered how we get the Old Testament? Have you ever wondered where the Old Testament come from? Like, how do the Jewish people memorize all this, or how do they even put it together? Well, somehow throughout history, God orchestrated these peace period. okay? So after they left Egypt, they defeated the five kings. Now is the peace time. The, the Israelites had time to write this down all the way to the end of Joshua. This is, there's nothing happening except them living in peace. So let's forward to Joshua chapter 24. Now, we started this series um, with David Benton, who began with the end. And we did that on purpose. Because the entire book of Joshua was about, don't turn right, don't turn left, Focus on God. That's it. That was God asking of them. Don't turn right. Don't turn left. Focus on God. And then at the end of chapter 24, uh, chapter verse 14, you guys know this verse very, very well. Now fear the Lord, serve him with all faithfulness, throw away the gods of your forefathers, worship beyond the river, and in Egypt. Serve the Lord, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether gods of your forefathers or uh, beyond, the, uh, beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites, whose land you are living. But as for me in my house, come on, you know this. As for me in my house, we will the Lord. So Joshua is standing in front of the entire assembly and said, hey, look, you can worship the gods beyond the Euphrates, where we left Egypt. Or you can worship the god of the Amorites, who you just saw us defeating them not too long ago. But as for me and my house, we will serve the... Now, if you are a really good Christian, you should have this verse in your house somewhere. How many of you guys have this verse in your house somewhere? All right. Good. Kelsey's getting an idea. Fred getting ready to spend your money on Hobby Lobby. Kelsey's like, yes, we need that in our house. We don't have that. Now, if you're a really good Christian, you would have this verse bought from Hobby Lobby, hung on top of a barn door in your house. Can you confirm? That's the way to do it. <laughs> Not any barn door, but the style of, like, Pennsylvania barn door. All right. So if you're a really good Christian, that's what you do, all right? So <laughs> some of you are like, guilty. Oh my gosh, we didn't realize we were doing that. <laughs> oh, you, <laughs> so, uh, so jo Joshua here is just repeating to the assembly what God asked him to do before he got into the promised land. Joshua chapter 23, he's repeating what's happening. So uh, chapter 23, verse six, be very strong, be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. 
one of you, listen to this, one of you routes a thousand because of the Lord your God fighting for you. Can you imagine going into battle like last week? I talked about like the, you know, this is Israel instead of, you know, that movie. This is Israel. Like one dude took down a thousand soldiers. That's incredible. He says, like, like God's fighting for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. Be very strong and courageous. This is all that Joshua is doing. He's, he's well in his age. He's old. He's an old man. He's getting ready to die. So he gathered the entire assembly. And he reminded them what happened. He reminded them what they had in Egypt. What, he reminded them what happened when God empowered Moses to lead them out of Egypt. And, then, and God stopped the water uh, in, in the Red Sea and split it apart. And then they went into the promised land, crossing the Jordan. The water stopped at flood stage three miles ahead. They didn't even get to see the miracles. Um, he reminded them about the walking around the walls of Jericho, and on the seventh time, the wall fell down, and then they went into the Amorites, and the, the battle began, and the kings, and Joshua looked at the kings, he looked at the Gibeonites, he looked at the Israelites, and he turned to the heaven, and he says, sun and moon, stop still. Stop moving. And you heard that last week. You can go back 11 weeks of this series, and you will hear farewell how God fought their battles for them. When we started this series, I explained to you what hope was. This Joshua is a book of hope. Hope for a new life, hope for a new generation, hope for a new way of living for the Israelites. No more oppressing, no more slavery, no more being under the whips of the Egyptians. So hope is the bridge. The bridge is that gap between what you know and what God's promise. So Joshua reminded them, you know about this. You know what God did. You've seen it. You heard it. We wrote it down. And then we know what God promised you is that if you continue to obey, then you're going to live a very peaceful life. So hope is this between space right here that bridges the two, and that's what we hold on to. The Israelites have no excuse to not know this. But hope is a funny thing, right? How do, you, how do you have hope? How do you hold on to hope? What is hope? How many of you guys seen the movie The Shawshank Redemption? It's probably one of the best pictures that ever, ever made. Red uh, was in jail for a while, and then uh, here comes a new guy named Andy Dupree. And then Andy come into jail, and then he start to make, be friend with, with Red, and then he explained to Red there's hope. And throughout this movie, they have an exchange back and forth, and I, I watch the movie, and I have to edit it in a way so it makes sense for you, okay? But I want you to get understand this. Andy is explaining to Red what hope is. And I don't want to ruin the movie for you. You should go home and watch it as well. But at the end of the movie, Red discover hope. Watch this. Hey. You, you, you couldn't play something good, huh? Hank Williams or something? They broke the door down before I could take requests. Was it worth it? <laughs> Two weeks in the hole? Easiest time I ever did. There's no such thing as easy time in the hole. That's right, a week in the hole is like a year. Damn straight. I am Mr. Mozart to keep me company. <laughs> so they let you tote that record player down there, huh? He's in here. In, in here. That's the beauty of music. They can't get that from you. Haven't you ever felt that way about music? Well, I played a main harmonica as a younger man. Lost interest in it, though. Didn't make much sense in here. Here's where it makes the most sense. You need it so you don't forget. Forget? Forget that... Places in the world that aren't made out of stone, that there's a there's something inside that they can't get to, that they, they can't touch. It's yours. What are you talking about? Hope. Hope. 
Let me tell you something, my friend. Hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. It's got no use on the inside. You better get used to that idea. Like Brooks did. I think you'll ever get out of here. I don't think I can make it on the outside, Andy. I've been in here most of my life. I'm an institutional man now. It's like Brooks was. Well, you underestimate yourself. I don't think so. I guess it comes down to a simple choice, really. Get busy living. Or get busy dying. Andy. Fred. If you ever get out of here, do me a favor. Sure, Andy. Anything. There's a big hay field up near Buxton. You know where Buxton is? There's a lot of hay fields up there. One in particular. It's got a long rock wall. A big oak tree at the north end. Promise me, Red. You ever get out, find that spot. At the base of that wall, you'll find a rock that has no earthly business in a main hayfield. A piece of black volcanic glass. There's something buried under it I want you to have. What happened? What's buried under it? Dear Red, if you're reading this, you've gotten out. And if you've come this far, maybe you're willing to come a little further. You remember the name of the town, don't you? Say what to nail. I could use a good man to help me get my project on wheels. I'll keep an eye out for you and the chessboard ready. Remember, Red, hope is a good thing. Maybe the best of things. And no good thing ever dies. I will be hoping that this letter finds you. And finds you well. Your friend, Andy. Remember, Red. Hope it's a good thing. Maybe the best of things. And no good thing ever dies. I will be hoping that this letter finds you and finds you well. Red has become an institutionalized man that be, around him was just the four brick walls. He has, he's lost hope of ever getting out, of ever being normal in society again until Andy Dupree came along and says, there's hope. Hope, hope is here. It, no one can take that away from you. They can't see it. They can feel it, but it's here. And God promises something in the book of Jeremiah. He says, for I know the plans I have for you. You know this. Declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Plans to give you hope in the future. So hope the entire nation of Israel are living under the, 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 the criticism of the rest of the world. Says, what are you doing? Why do you keep worshiping this God? He doesn't even exist. But they held on to hope because they knew what God promised them. And then Jesus comes along and he says, I have come. I have come so you can have life and have it to the full. This is now our hope. We hold on to the promises of Jesus, what he said in his death and his burial and his resurrection. That's the hope, and no one can take that away from you. Because it's in here. And the world's going to continue to criticize you, going to make fun of you, and tell you you are no longer a part of what we're doing. You're mean, you're judgmental, you're exclusive, because they don't know hope. But for some of us, somewhere, somewhere along the line, 
life just beats you down, doesn't it? Somewhere along the line, you lost hope. And all you see is people throwing things at you, making fun of you, or challenging your faith. Maybe a, a rebellious child, or, or a loss of job, or an uncomfortable position. And you lost hope. Maybe things happen in your life, you're like, how can there be a God? If there's a God, why would this happen to me? And all you see around you is a four wall of lost hope. Maybe a relationship gone wrong or, or financial situations that you have no idea what happened. And you lost hope. Maybe your sin has gotten in the way and, and all you see is the things that surrounded you and, and somewhere along the line in your life you lost hope. You, there's this child that grew up and loves the Lord and run around in the church aisle and you came to Sunday school and you heard the millions of sermons and somewhere along the line that little child that believed in God lost hope. Your marriage is going well and one person did something that hurts your feelings and you lost hope in God. Or maybe your friendship and someone said something the wrong way and you lost hope in God. And all you see is the four wall like red, like I'm an institutional lie. There's God doesn't exist. Where is God? And then and hope is gone in your life. And that load of you that believed in God who thinks everything is possible, that load of you that remember the quote that God knows I have the plans for you, plans to prosper you, plans to keep you safe, is no longer exist. You're not sure if you can even quote that anymore. In some way, you lost hope. Oh, hope, hope for me is it's watching my wife pray for my children, that the hope that a mother holds on to. Some of you moms know what I'm talking about. A hope is a husband who works it as hard as he can to provide. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. A hope is a it's a family member. It's someone along the way pray for you and hold you together. A mom that doesn't give up that her son is going to make it. A relationship that you pray every night, you say, God, make this right. And that's hope. Hope is an addiction that you can't kick. But you're holding on and you're praying. That's hope. But somewhere along the line in your life, that hope no longer exists. It's gone. You wonder where it went. All you see is pressure and sin and mistakes and stress. All you see is busyness. And you lost hope. You lost hope in Jesus. You lost hope in your faith. You lost hope in the Bible. You're here, but you're not really here. You're here because of someone else. You're watching online because someone made you watch it online. But somewhere along in your life, you lost hope. And hope is the, the bridge, is that, that gap between God's promise in your life and, and, and what you see and then a promise of a brighter future. What's ahead? You might not know what that looks like over there, but you know what God did for you over here. And that's hope. Hope is when I drove down this road 10 years of my life. That God whispers in my heart and said, knew you're going to be in that building one day. Just forgive and move on. Just forgive and move on. That's hope. Hope is when God calls you and he says, come home. Come home, and you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because at, at one point in your life, that little kid that accepted Jesus knew the Scripture, knew Jeremiah, knew, says, God, know the plans I have for you and plans to prosper you, to give you hope, not to harm you. And that child is no longer there. Because along the line, life beats you down because of your own sins or the sins of other people for whatever reason, but life beats you down and you lose hope. 
Because of hope, we have this. Because of hope that these guys who sat in jail and says, because I want you to know this hope that I'm writing this letter so you can have it. That's hope. Because of hope, these guys travel across the sea and shipwrecked and in jail and beaten and made fun of. The entire family was taken from them, but they continue to write these letters. If we, we can have it, so we can know hope. That's hope. Hope is when God said to Jeremiah, you're not going to be able to get married. You're not going to be able to have kids. Matter of fact, your entire life, Jeremiah, is going to be very lonely. You're not going to go to your parents' funeral, Jeremiah. That's hope for Jeremiah went and wrote down the book of Jeremiah and Lamentations. That's hope. Hope is when Peter submitted himself to the Roman guards and they crucify him upside down. And he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Peter for us to have. That's hope. Hope is when John's sitting in Patmos in jail and he couldn't see anymore. He has to ask the Roman guard for help to write down the letter 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And even the book of John and the book of Revelation, so we can have these letters in hands. That's hope. Because it's in here and no one can take that away from you. Hope is when God says, I'm going to give you my son. And Jesus, you're not going to have a normal life. Jesus, you're going to you're not going to be able to have real relationships. You're not going to have really any true friends at all because your 12 friends that you're going to have, one of them is going to betray you at dinner. The other 11 is going to run away the moment you get arrested. And they're going to, matter of fact, they're going to say they never knew you. And they're going to take you and they're going to flog you and they're going to put you on the cross. And Jesus says, send me. That hope so we can have this we call the Bible. And sitting in the little jail cell, hungry, doesn't know where his next meal is gonna come from, doesn't even know he's gonna live to make it to the next day, doesn't know where, who's gonna bring him food, doesn't know the next beating is gonna happen. Sitting in the little jail cell underneath the praetorium in the Roman guards all around him. And Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That is hope because it's in here and no one can take that away from you. And he wrote these words, Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace, which is we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been giving us. You see, just at the right time, just just at the right time, where everything line up, When we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, Christ die for us. Somewhere you missed that part. Somewhere you missed the part where Christ has broken down these walls for you. Somewhere you missed the part that you don't have to go through it by yourself. Somewhere you missed the part that God is carrying you along this whole time. Somewhere you missed the part that you don't have to live inside of that. And you lost hope. And Joshua 
calls the assembly. Arrow, band, come forward. Um, Lewis and Alicia, come and get your, hold your positions here. God called the, the, the assembly together. I want you to get this picture. This is, this is not three points to make your life better and whatever. Uh, this is a religious ceremony of what's happening at the end of Joshua in his finer farewell. It's a religious service. So Joshua called the entire assembly. So it's like, we're going to do that now. Let, let's stand up. I want you guys to stand up. I want you guys to, to, to grasp what's happening here. So Joshua called the entire assembly. And he's speaking to them. And they responded. So I'm going to read the Joshua part. Today could be different for you. Today could be a new day for you where you make that commitment to Christ again. And somewhere along the line, this thing beats you down, and, and today could be different. And th if that's not you today, it's okay. Don't say anything, but just participate somehow. You don't have to accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, today, so don't say anything. But for you who've been found down this road, this could be a new commitment for you today. As for you and your house, you will serve the Lord. So I'm going to read the Joshua part, and one of our elders, Errol, going to lead you into reading the congregational part as a way for you to make a new commitment to Christ. So Joshua gathered the assembly, and he says, Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, and you did also the Amorites, the Parasites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gerashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I gave them into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also, the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which did not toll in cities you did not build. And you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's read together verse 16. For be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which he traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disasters on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. No, we will serve the Lord. 
you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses. Now then, Amen. throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. See? The stone. Thank you, Earl. This stone will serve as a witness. This stone will serve as a monument of your commitment to God today. And when you look at this stone, you remember the promise you made for God. And in front of the entire assembly, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, Jesus says, remember the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Lord has done this marvelous in your sight. So Joshua used the stone as a promise for his people to remember. So Jesus comes along and he says, I am that stone. I am the promise that Joshua told you a long time ago. I'm the stone that everyone's talking about. And because of the stone that's been rejected by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, now this stone becomes our promise. Now, if you have a big enough stage, I would like to throw this against this to illustrate to you that Jesus shattered away all the things that has boxed you in. I'm not going to do that because of legality reasons you know there's a lawyer in here and there's insurance guys in here but you get the point that the cornerstone of Jesus Christ is shatter everything in your life that might box you in institutionalizing you that you can't make it you can't go beyond from here you can't be a difference you can't change that's the lies of you know who but because in the words of Jesus Christ he says the cornerstone can make that break and it can happen, and it happens to you in your life. It can happen today. And in the book of Hebrew, the writer pleaded with his congregation. He says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unservingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. <laughs>